Welcome everyone to our 43rd, including our third virtual San Juan Preservation Trust annual meeting. I realized while putting together my welcome remarks that for many of you, I am the first entirely virtual Preservation Trust board president. Is this Keith or his avatar? Someday I hope to enjoy the pleasure of greeting you in person. To begin, let our thoughts and most importantly, our actions guide our acknowledgement that we reside on the ancestral lands and waters of the Coast Salish people who have called this place home since time immemorial and let us honor the inherent Aboriginal and treaty rights that have been passed on from generation to generation. Words are important, actions more so. The Preservation Trust has, among other changes, taken on some initial steps to remove equal access barriers to both our preserves and our membership and board qualifications. This is just the start. There is so much more work to do. I am pleased to announce that 111 households have registered for this live webinar. For us to get a better sense of the number of individuals joining us live today, please take a quick moment to answer the poll coming up on your screen, telling us the number of people who are watching at your location. Thank you. We have been through a challenging couple of years and the trials and tribulations continue as they will. I submit to you that one of the more significant life-affirming responses to the multitude of global crises is collective local action. Locally is where you get to experience personally the positive impacts your attention engenders. As members of the San Juan Preservation Trust, you understand this and know that without your generous contributions of money and or time, the Preservation Trust would cease to exist. Because of your engagement and generosity, you have positively contributed not only to the quality of life and its resilience in the archipelago, but also to a legacy of hope for generations to come. Thank you. I would also like to thank your Preservation Trust Board of Directors. All Board of Directors, please stand to be acknowledged. Oh, oh, that, that will not work. Well, at least I can show you a picture of your current board officers. Vice President Ro Barbara Rosencotter, Treasurer Willie Borner, and Secretary Sarah Hart. Seriously, all three of these good people have once again and again generously agreed to take on the extra effort and responsibility of yet another term as officers. We are grateful for your continued leadership. I would like now to show you a short video graciously provided by Graffiti Associates. We are a collection of islands bound together by a single sea, the Salish, an area of richness and diversity, of bird and mammal, flower and fish of color and of light, as beautiful as it is fragile. And so we preserve, we conserve, we care, and we connect with nature, with each other, with ourselves to this special place held together by a single sea a place called the San Juan Islands, a place we call home. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce your exceedingly dedicated, competent, and compassionate executive director, Angela Anderson. Thank you, Keith, and thank you for the leadership you've shown us the last three years as board president. 
During your tenure, you have helped shepherd enormous growth within this organization. You've been a close confidant and a true partner in leading the Preservation Trust through these challenging times. Thank you again for all you've done and continue to do. Friends, it's lovely to be back with you all. Our theme for this year, Growing Together, seems quite apt given the remarkable wildflower bloom we're seeing across the islands this spring. Like this year's bloom, the growth of the Preservation Trust has been spurred by a confluence of factors. Before highlighting all the important work we've accomplished, I'd like to acknowledge our dedicated team and show you how we've grown. Here's a look at the conservation dream team that is the Preservation Trust. Note, I've stuck in a flower sticker on some of the pictures. These are our newest recruits. Um, call them our budding blooms, if you will. We re begin with our operations and finance with director Tom Tidyman and Marianne Tynan. Next, we have our philanthropy program, Kristen Buckley at the helm with Olivia Walcott Gonda. Olivia is another fresh face having just started this past March. On to our conservation program, we have Vicki Edwards and Kathleen Foley Lewis. Kathleen is one of the longest standing employees with the trust. She's quite multifaceted and bridges both conservation and our stewardship team. And next I'm gonna move on to stewardship. And we have Director Dean Doherty and I'll stop here for a virtual round of applause. Dean um, will be celebrating his 20th year uh, with the Preservation Trust on um, June 1st this year. Dean has led the expansion of the stewardship team over the past year with new recruits, Troy Buckley and Megan Howard. You may recall Troy was last year's volunteer of the year. Other vital members of our team include Kathleen Foley Lewis, Rob Roy McGregor, and our preserved caretakers, Tom Pence, Alden Remington, and Elena and Thyatira Thompson. Moving to communications and outreach, this presentation much uh, would not be possible without our intrepid professional communications team uh, being, and it is led by Craig Canine uh, and supported by Liz Doan, Ruthie Doherty and Jack Rasale. It's an honor to work with each of these amazing people to my team, thank you for your sincere commitment and dedication to the mission. And now, our announcements uh, and accomplishments in each of the three C's, Conserve, Care, Connect, beginning with Conserve. This was another banner year for conservation. You'll see here um, that we've uh, added uh, quite a number of properties to our priority list. We've got four conservation easements and two preserves that were added to our portfolio, totaling 493 acres. Here are a couple of our most recent projects. In December, we closed on a bargain sale purchase of the Haya Biological Reserve. SJPT is managing this property uh, subject to the terms of a conservation land, uh, conservation land bank conservation easement on the property. Uh, key aspects of the property are its wetland habitat, a diverse mixed age forest, and a stream corridor, which forms an important link from Trout Lake to Zilster Lake. Next, we added to our conservation easements in 2022, the Brostrom easement. This consists of two parcels totaling over 30 acres on Waldron. The property includes more than 1,700 feet of shoreline with two pocket beaches and a rocky point, an abundant camas, as well as diversity of other native flora. Permanent protection of this stunning and significant property was made possible by Mickey and Ken Brostrom. As is our tradition, we will offer a gift of a oak, uh, oak sapling to them in honor of their foresight. In contributing to this CE, Mickey and Ken were able to fulfill their long-term goal of seeing their Waldron property protected. With this donation, they hope to inspire others to expand this beloved natural landscape. All right. 
we're ready to move on to uh, the second C, care. With more and more properties conserved each year, our stewardship responsibilities continue to expand. Uh, we're increasing restoration efforts on our preserves, building new partnerships, and leveraging grant opportunity. First, I'd like to show you uh, what we've been doing at our False Bay Creek property. This year, we initiated a multi-phase restoration project on the creek with grant funds from the Department of Ecology and San Juan County Conservation District. With our partners, we installed over 3,000 feet of fencing to exclude livestock from the creek and planted hundreds of willow and other wetland plants to restore the riparian habitat. Other care accomplishments include the continued expansion of our bluebirds and butterflies program. We continue to grow the bluebird program and participate in the island marble habitat restoration. Last year, the bluebird program transitioned to being mostly volunteer led. Some folks um, are becoming more and more involved with their avian neighbors and bluebird numbers continue to remain steady. And for a second year in a row, island marble butterflies have laid eggs and hatched larvae at the Fraser Homestead Preserve. We have our fingers crossed that, that some of them will hatch this spring. So only time will tell. All of this great work would not be possible without our committed volunteers. We truly owe a debt of gratitude for the volunteers who help us each day. Among this notable group is a volunteer who's literally left his mark. Here's a clip honoring this year's Volunteer of the Year, Skip Bold of Shaw Island. Day out on the water. Yeah. Nice right. to meet you. Yeah, I've heard a lot of great things about all the volunteer work you've helped us do around Parks Bay and the Ellis Preserve over here. It's been a pleasure. Anyways, I would love to hear more about what you've done to help us out and get to know you a bit. Uh, well, let's go for a roll. All right. It's a great okay. day for you. You're going to get your feet wet. I usually work Parks Bay when Ruthie is here, or not Parks Bay, but I mean the trust. And she often has projects she needs help with. Feels free to call me and I just show up. My work at the Preservation Trust started about three, possibly four years ago. Ruthie had, I think, just had just started here, and this state was full of marine gear, boats and, and odd fittings and steam whistles and charts and all manner of things. And some of these things she couldn't even identify and ultimately I couldn't either because some of them went back quite a ways. Antiques. But she called me one day and she said, would you come over and help me catalog this maritime stuff? And tell me what it is. And so I showed up thinking I'd be here for an hour and I got absolutely fascinated with the, with the place and the, and the gear she wanted me to identify and help her value. And, and then I started working in the library, uh, organizing uh, the maritime files. And, so, Skip, I also understand that you're kind of a jack of all trades. Can you go through some of the different projects you've you've helped us out with? Well, I carved a lot of signs, for instance, um, here. Uh, fixed a lot of things here. Uh, it's hard for me to remember all the little projects I did here. Well, maybe we could get on shore and go check some of them out. Yeah probably 20 gates on the property. Most of them were falling off their hinges and I fixed most of them. <laughs> uh, the font on the, this gate sign is, is the same font that's used on the, all the county road sites on the island. Yeah, I carved this in Fred's little shop over there one summer day. It was very pleasant. <laughs> but Ruthie said she wanted a bird perch out here. And mm -hmm. in the barn, the machine shed over there, there were a whole bunch of ash, wooden, 
pump rods, things that went up and down in a well like that. And I said, well, why don't we screw two of those together? We'll slam them down in the mud and we'll put some branches on them. So I beachcombed some branches and screwed them on. So now when there are songbirds around here, they perch there and, and get the mosquitoes and stuff that are at, in the pond. That's perfect. Operations like this wouldn't get much done without volunteer work, that's for sure. And from the standpoint of the volunteer, me, uh, and others, it's rewarding. And it's wonderful to come back to a place like this and think of the time I've spent here and, and even see some of the things I've done. Mm -hmm. It's rewarding. Well, Skip, thanks for the, for the boat ride and for <laughs> showing us around. You've done so much great work around the Ellis Preserve. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Anytime I can give anybody a boat ride, I'm, <laughs> I'm willing. Now that you are officially our Volunteer of the Year, uh, we have a little s small token of our gratitude. <laughs> we, uh, it's not too much, but we, as a nautical guy, we hope you appreciate it. Well, you're a real lifesaver. <laughs> yeah, just Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> And I won't jump in the water with it right now, <laughs> but maybe eventually. <laughs> Might save your life. Thank you, Skip, and congratulations once again. Human connections to nature and to one another is key to our work. Over the past year, the Preservation Trust has continued to expand our commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Our board and staff working group uh, meets regularly to ensure that these values permeate our work. To, to better carry out the three C's of our mission, we're exploring opportunities to broaden accessibility, be it in our communications, our signage, or to our preserves. Further, we're excited about expanded opportunities for youth and educational partnerships. One of the latest investments in our youth programs was the creation of a new position that of education specialist. Liz Doan, the newest member of our team, just joined us this past month. We've received our, uh, we've increased our capacity for education programming with help from a grant from the Dean Witter Foundation. This funding will allow us to expand our already existing partnerships with the Youth Conservation Corps, schools and teachers throughout the islands to better connect young people with nature. And now the chair of our Connect Committee, Michael Popney, will present this year's Climate Leadership Scholars. Michael. Good evening, all. Thanks very much for joining us. I have the pleasure of introducing our Climate Leadership Scholars for 2022, the third year of our program. Recognizing that climate change is altering the islands and the waters that the Preservation Trust protects. Our board of trustees established a climate leadership scholarship program for seniors graduating from island high schools or doing a homeschooled alternative. These scholarships are intended to recognize and encourage young members of our community who are leading the way to a more hopeful climate future. Individual board members funded two $4,000 scholarships. Out of a very impressive field of applicants, the selection committee chose Isara Greeson from Lopez Island High School and Luke Fincher from Friday Harbor High School. We would like you to meet our scholars. Craig, roll the video. Sarah Grayson and I am a senior at Lopez Island High School um, and I am 17 and I have lived on Lopez since I was three but I was born in Thailand and my dad grew up here so yeah I've just grown up here my whole life pretty much and I really loved it. My name is Luke Fincher. Uh, I've been involved with climate action and working with the environment for a, a very long time, almost my entire life here, my entire family has been very involved in this stuff. And 
I think when I really started to jump into everything was around sixth grade when I joined the Youth Conservation Corps in San Juan Island. And I've been doing that since. So I, I've obviously stuck around and uh, I've worked with different organizations like the Preservation Trust. And it's always been such an awesome experience. So. and I'm super, super grateful. Um, and I know that a Lopez student, or at least I think that a Lopez student hasn't received this scholarship in a while. So I am just super grateful to be able to have received it. And I also hope that by me receiving it, um, other Lopez students will be inspired to also take action on their um, climate concern too. Uh, I, I feel incredibly grateful to be selected for this scholarship. It's. It's truly an honor to be viewed um, as a climate leader in our community and having the scholarship is just really validating so I, I really feel incredible. I feel like climate is an issue that like expands across multiple subjects um, and I will be attending Scripps College in Claremont, California, which is a liberal arts college. So um, I hope that with my access to like a interdisciplinary education, I will be able to explore the like crossover between climate change and the various subjects that I'll be studying. Um, yeah, like for example, I am really interested in nutrition. Like my hope is that um, by going to Scripps, I will be able to explore this crossover and how um, by like changing our diets, we may be able to also like positively affect the climate issue. So. My concerns with climate change issues have almost directly impacted my choice of occupation and my choices with college. I want to become a climate and environmental psychologist. I, I really want to help people improve their interactions with the environment while also simultaneously improving their own quality of life. I think that quite simply, we need a healthier planet to live a healthier life. I do feel like um, climate change is a very heavy issue and it's really easy to feel like it's hopeless. Um, but for me personally, just seeing the um, like amount of people who have like risen up all over the world to try to take action for this, especially the youth, has been really inspiring and gives me a lot of hope because it makes me feel a lot less alone in trying to like take this on. I think one of the, the biggest things that gives me hope is knowing that there's many other young people just like myself who are willing to address climate change issues and um, willing to seek new solutions and feel called to action. Um, just knowing that there's so many other people out there that are, are willing to join me in this fight is really validating and that, that really gives me hope going into the future. Well, I have to say watching that really inspires me. And um, I'm certainly impressed this year again with this year's winners. Um, Luke and Isara, all of our members are wishing you both a very successful college career. This program in the past has been funded exclusively by board members. Um, as, as we gather funding for our 2023 program, we are opening this up to our membership that would like to assist. We are hoping to grow the program and increase the awards in 2023 with your help. This is an established and proven program. You will see a link in the chat box that will allow you to donate to this program. It will be available until the end of the meeting. Um, Jane Goodall recently said, I believe that there is hope that we will be able to address climate change because of the resilience of nature and the power of young people. I hope you will join us in supporting our young people with your financial assistance. Oh, and one final wish from me personally, vote like the planet depends on it because it does. Um, 
Thanks for allowing me to talk with you tonight. And now I want to hand off to Kristen Buckley, our Director of Philanthropy. Bye-bye. Thanks, Michael. You've met some of our stars already tonight. Our Volunteer of the Year, our two scholarship recipients. And I'd like to introduce another group of stars, our donors. This is a group of people who have prioritized protecting and caring for our island archipelago by sharing their resources. Their contributions fuel everything you're hearing about this evening. I hope that you see yourselves, your donations, your impact when you hear about the Preservation Trust's accomplishments over the past year. It is this partnership that secures the future for our islands. Start rolling the names, please. I'd like to recognize the members of our GAN Society. You, you'll, you will see their names on the screen shortly. This is a group of far-sighted individuals who have included gifts to the Preservation Trust in their estate plans. They may have included contributions in their wills or trusts, named us as beneficiaries of their retirement accounts, or plan to donate property at their passing. Their legacy is the collective positive impact that their future support will have on the San Juan Islands. We currently have over 100 individuals or couples in the GAN Society. As the pandemic allows, we will resume our gathering of this group to enjoy each other's company and to celebrate the future that they will help create. We're grateful to this group for their planning for the future. And finally, I'd like to offer our gratitude to former members of the GAN Society. They have made legacy gifts that are beginning to have impact now or will in the very near future. You'll see their names on the screen here. We're deeply indebted to them. And to all of our donors, we express our deep gratitude. And now I'd like to bring back Angela for a glimpse into our future. Angela? Thank you, Kristen. And uh, I am going to start at our uh, conservation strategic plan. We are renewing our accreditation this year, um, but I want to jump forward into our conservation st uh, strategic plan uh, because there's a lot to say about that. Uh, thanks to many of you, our consultants at Core GIS and Conservation Techniques, the long-awaited strategic conservation plan is nearly complete. This cr critical plan builds upon many years of successes and collaborative partnerships with you all. These successes are displayed beside me in an animated story map, starting from our inception in 1979 through this year. You'll see progress proceeded slowly at the beginning, and over time, the pace of conservation has accelerated. The conservation strategic plan is a critical component of our work because it identifies and prioritizes conservation opportunities that will help guide our efforts into the next decade. More importantly, the plan will help us meet our most pressing conservation needs by integrating the most up-to-date climate change data and analysis into our process. It is also, but it'll also help us continue to complement the work of our partners and continue to leverage our resources with theirs. This means more creative conservation opportunities to protect this special place. Stay tuned and stay connected with SJPT for more details on our strategic conservation plan later this year. I've also two really exciting projects to share with you next. The first is the Lopez Hill Preserve Edition. Immediately adjacent to the 400 acre Lopez Hill Preserve lies 117 acres of forest, streams, open grassland, and agricultural fields. Three conservation partners are working together to protect this land. The San Juan Preservation Trust, the San Juan County Conservation Land Bank, and the Lopez Community Land Trust. Last year, the land bank purchased 75 acres of the 117 from the Lopez Community Land Trust to add to their existing Lopez Hill Preserve. 
The Preservation Trust is now working with the land bank to place a conservation easement over the area to ensure that it's permanently protected. We've received a matching funds grant from an anonymous donor that will cover up to half the cost of the CE. Fundraising efforts are presently underway to fully utilize this match grant. If you're interested in supporting the Lopez Hill edition, please do, re please do reach out to us. And next, I am thrilled to share with you about the latest project that is in the works. It's currently under contract. It is the North Shore Conservation Easement, also known as Glenwood Inn. Glenwood Inn is one of the few large shoreline properties on Orcas that's come on the market in recent decades. While Orcas is the largest island in the archipelago, it has the least amount of publicly accessible shoreline of any of the ferry service islands, with less than 12% of Orcas's shoreline accessible to the public. This joint project with the Conservation Land Bank will protect and restore the critical habitat, as well as provide public access. The property is one of the highest priority regions for salmon recovery. And we're currently applying for grant funds to help us protect and restore this vital ecosystem once the property has been acquired. This multi-million dollar project is a huge endeavor. We've sec secured the short-term financing to enable the purchase. And if all goes well, we'll be able to close by the end of June. We begin fundraising for the project in earnest thereafter. So stay tuned, we will be in touch. Helping make sure we have the finances in place to successfully pull off this feat is another, none other than our astute treasurer, Willie Warner, who is here now to provide the annual financial report. Willie, I'm passing this over to you. Uh, thank you, Angela. Good evening, everyone. As a treasurer, it is my pleasure to present to you the financial results for the past year, 20. 21 and the comparison also the results of 2020. You see that the numbers are in some categories very different between these two years. As you might remember, the year 2020 was very unusual because we had a generous donor which resulted in large land transactions within that year. 2021 looks what I would call more normal. The numbers you are seeing are in thousands. I have to point out to you that the 2021 results are not yet audited. That will happen later this year. The financial statements for 2020 were audited by Clark Newball. Please note that audited financial reports will be available uh, up in request. Let's look at the abbreviated statement uh, of the uh, financial position on your left. Cash and cash equivalents was a little over 4.5 million as compared to 6 million in 2020. The investments have done quite well with an increase of 2.5 million. I'll elaborate on this more later. Conservation land stayed about the same between those two years. So the overall assets increased by about 1.4 million. On the liability side, on the right, or on the bottom, sorry. You, you, so you see the uh, notice that the San Juan Preservation Trust has virtually no debt. Now let's look at the abbreviated summary of activities for 2021 and 2020. That's on your right. The general contributions and grants have stayed the same between those two years. Thank you all for making these wonderful donations from year to year. The unrestricted bequests in 2021 were $268,000 uh, versus $700,000 in 2020. Bequests to us uh, come to us with little notice and for obvious reasons cannot be planned on. The same goes for gifts of land. As you know, the investment climate in 2020 and 2021 have been very good. Therefore, the investment income and interests have came to close to $2 million versus about $1.6 million in 2020. I say this every year, past performance does not guarantee future success, especially now with the market volatility we have seen lately, we could see significant market corrections this year. However, 
keep in mind that the investments are placed in fairly conservative in instruments and with a very long-term outlook. The restricted contributions for land acquisitions, stewardship, endowment, and other came in at 710,000 as compared to uh, 10 million, uh, 10.7 million in 2020. That again stems from the large donation from the very generous donor as mentioned earlier. As a result, the 2021 total support and revenue were 4.7 million versus 15 million in 2020. Let's look at the expense and acquisitions uh, below. The conservation programs increased from 1.17 million in 2020 to 1.48 million in 2021. This is a given, considering the organization is growing both in land holdings and conservation easements. Therefore, there is a growing demand to take care of these lands. Administration and fundraising was 682,000 in 2021 versus 495,000 in 2020. Conservation easements and acquisitions increased to just over 1 million in 2021 versus 406,000 in 2020. The increase of these two line items uh, is due to our growing nature, resulting with an increase of staff to cope with the ever rising demand in, in, these, in these areas. The last item here is transfer, uh, transfers of land to public entities. In 2020, it shows an expense of about 5 million versus none in 2021. Again, this is a direct result from the large donation in 2020. As a net result, 2021 shows a net income of just over 1.5 million versus 7.9 million in 2020. That's why I said earlier that 2021 looks more like a normal, but nevertheless, a great year we can all be proud of. Lastly, I want to show you the results more graphically in a pie chart. Craig, can you pull up the pie chart, please? Just briefly, um, on the income side, we have the unrestricted gifts at uh, for, uh, 43% and an almost, almost equal investment income of 42%. Restricted gifts and income make up the balance uh, with uh, 15%. On the right side, we show the expense programs in percent. Land transfers and easement purchases show at 32%, program expenses at 46%, and fundraising at 8%, and administration at 14%. Let's look at the bottom chart. Because the expense of land transfers and easement purchases tend to skew the overall picture of the operating expenses, this chart leaves out that item to better reflect the operating, uh, the operating picture. So we have acquisitions at 11, stewardship at 42, education at 16, and um, fundraising at 11, and administration at 21%. By the way, education includes communication and outreach as well. That concludes my presentation uh, of the financial picture. I'm again proud to say that the San Juan Preservation Trust continues in a strong financial position enabling us to tackle the tasks waiting uh, ahead of us. Thank you all very much for your continued participation and support. Last but not least, I want to thank Tom Tideman and Susie Janet for all the great effort and work they have put into tackling all the financial tasks while at the same time looking for software efficiencies to make the process more streamlined uh, in the future. Thank you all. And now I like to introduce Nancy Green, our chair of the nominating and governance uh, committee. Here you go, Nancy. Thank, thank you, you, Willie. Thank you. Hello all. Um, one of the most important accomplishments this past year was the revision of our bylaws. And some key elements were changed in order to expand the nature of our membership. So the first thing is that eligibility requirements for membership were increased. And in addition to those of you who provide support of the trust through financial means, we have now begun including those who volunteer their time and efforts as annual members. Those who donate or provide bargain sales of conservation easements or land 
are acknowledged as lifetime members of the trust. Anyone who has ties to these islands, whether it be a resident, own property or have a passion for the islands and is contributing in any of these ways is eligible for membership. Next, we moved, as you'll see, saw this year, we moved from paper ballots to electronic voting. Electronic voting and other digital notifications are going to help advance our efforts towards a more paperless system. And finally, our bylaws uh, require a quorum of 10% of our members. And I would love to thank all of you who voted for our current board members as we surpassed that goal. I'm pleased to announce that the following individuals have been re-elected to the board. Eric Anderson, at large representation, Willie Borner, Shaw Island, Nancy Green, Lopez Island, Sarah Hart, at large, Pete Kilpatrick, at large, Joanne Otto, at large, Michael Popany, at large, Barbara Rosencotter, at large, Phil Sherburn at large, Camille Euler, San Juan Island, and Keith Wentworth, San Juan Island. Congratulations to all of you. Finally, I would like to offer a very special thanks to the entire board and all of our staff who have worked diligently these past couple of years. It is an honor to work with this committed group of people. Now, it's my true pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, who is a longtime supporter and partner of the Preservation Trust, Eliza Habegger. Eliza holds a BA in biology and botany from Cornell University. She previously worked for the Nature Conservancy and the New York Botanical Garden and has dedicated the last 19 years in public service as a land steward for the San Juan County Conservation Land Bank. Eliza manages the Salish Seeds Project a native plant nursery, which is a joint project of the Preservation Trust and the Conservation Land Bank. She's here today to share with you information about our project and plans to continue growing. Eliza. Thank you, Nancy. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. Let me start my presentation. There we go. As noted, the Salish Seeds Project is a partnership between the San Juan County Conservation Land Bank and the Preservation Trust. It's come far from humble beginnings and it's still growing. The Salish Seeds Project enables the restoration of native wildflowers and grasses in the San Juan Islands. Stewardship of native plants is central to both our organization's goals for a simple reason, Native plants support healthy local ecosystems, and they do so far better than introduced plants. Our island wildlife evolved alongside these species. They're at the very base of local food webs. For example, let's consider the Gary Oak. In our region, the seemingly tough and unpalatable leaves of Gary Oak can provide food for no less than 201 species of moths and butterflies. That's data from the National Wildlife Federation. No wonder birds spend so much time foraging in Gary Oaks, especially when they're feeding their young. Acorns feed other wildlife, like band-tailed pigeons and squirrels, and the natural cavities in the trunk are great nest spots. Or let's take Douglas Aster, which blooms in late summer when wildflowers are scarce. It attracts large numbers of pollinating insects, bumblebees, leafcutter bees, the skipper butterfly shown here. And during the fall and winter time, the seeds of Douglas Aster feed birds and other small animals. It's easy to assume that native plants are doing great in the islands. Douglas firs are everywhere, salal and ocean spray, wild rose are abundant. Our madrona trees look great, but while some plants do thrive, many are not in good shape. The plants of Gary Oak savannas, native prairies, and similar habitats are in trouble. 
It's estimated that 95% of these habitat types are gone from our region. Residential development, agriculture, too many deer, invasive plants, and the lack of fire, all these and more have contributed to their dramatic decline. It's no wonder that the Land Bank and the Preservation Trust have prioritized these habitats for protection and for active restoration. About 10 years ago, we realized we had a big problem. We were making good progress in restoring the open character of oak and prairies on conservation lands. We'd done this by cutting down and removing the trees and invasive shrubs that had taken over in the absence of wildfire. However, we found we were failing to restore the rich tapestry of wildflowers and grasses that used to be there. Instead, we usually ended up with non-native grasses or pesky weeds like thistle. We just couldn't find a source for the native plants that we wanted to encourage. And so we decided we'd just have to grow them ourselves. It started with a dedicated group of volunteers. In the beginning, we weren't really sure what we were doing, but we knew we wanted to try. We started by collecting seed from the wild here in the islands. We wanted to know that we were growing the right genetic strains that had evolved here and were suited to our unique local conditions. We often had to cage out deer in order to get seeds from certain plants. It turns out deer really like to eat the nutritious seed pods just before the seed turns ripe and dry. In 2015, we set up a small nursery at Red Mill Farm on San Juan Island, and the Salish Seeds Project was born. Funding from grants and private donations over the past several years have allowed us to gradually build up a third of an acre facility with deer fencing, irrigation, electricity, and most recently, a work shed. The San Juan Preservation Trust owns the facility. The land bank runs the nursery. Having a good facility really makes a difference. This newly completed shed has transformed our operation, providing space for tools and a functional indoor work area, which we previously lacked. It also features a living roof planted with two dozen species of native plants. We're hoping to add a small greenhouse one day soon. I invite anyone who'd like to help to consider making a gift. Volunteers still play an important role at the Salish Seeds Project. In particular, the Master Gardener Program volunteers have contributed many hours in hard work, particularly weeding. Uh, participants in the Master Gardeners Program receive expert training, and then in exchange, they give back to the community by volunteering their time for projects such as ours. The Salish Seeds Project grows plants and seeds of over 60 native species, most of them from oak, prairie, and coastal habitats. Shown here, plants are being grown for seed harvest. On the right there, seed is being swept and vacuumed with a dust buster off of tarps where it falls when it's ripe. Although our scale of production is small and our work is all done with hand labor, we're able to grow a lot of seed. We produced a record 20 pounds of seed in 2021. Some of the seed we produce is then directly sown back onto the landscape at habitat restoration sites. This seed is headed to turtleback. Some of it is sown in containers and grown up in the nursery, and then those plants can be used for restoration or other projects. We grow a lot of plants in these small tubular containers called plugs. Plugs are simple and efficient to transport. They take up little space and they're easy to plant with minimal ground disturbance. Shown here, federally listed rare golden paintbrush is being grown out for restoration on San Juan Island. We also grow some plants in larger containers and sell them to the general public at occasional special events. 
in response to popular demand. We're also happy to grow plants for anyone by advance order. We'll grow plants to order for landowners, other conservation land managers, landscapers, anyone who's interested. All plants and seeds that we sell are priced so as to reimburse the land bank for the cost of production, our biggest expense being staff time. And finally, in addition to seeds and container plants, we grow some species so that we can harvest their bulbs for replanting elsewhere. Here's chocolate lily, a local favorite with elegant blooms. We grow a lot of camas, both common camas and great camas, which brings me to the important point that many, if not most of the plants we grow are cultural plants for Coast Salish people. And it's thanks to Coast Salish stewardship of the landscape that they once grew here in such abundance. The sweet energy rich bulbs of camas were once a staple for indigenous people throughout the Pacific Northwest. Camas is thought to have been the second most widely traded commodity in what's now the Western US. The number one commodity, dried salmon. But think of how much camas there must have been Coast Salish people managed the landscape using intentional fire and other techniques to promote the growth of camas and many, many other useful plants. Plants like stinging nettle, the stem fibers of nettle are used to make very good twine, fishing line, fish nets. Plants like Indian celery, the seeds of which are used as medicine for colds and other respiratory ailments. Interesting plants like soapberry, soapy compounds in the fruit allow it to be whipped up into a froth or so-called Indian ice cream. It can be sweetened with other berries, with camas or with sugar. It's far too bitter for my tastes, but I probably lack the knowledge to pick the berries at the right stage or process them correctly. A few years ago, the Coast Salish Youth Conservation Corps volunteered some time at the nursery. We transplanted camas bulbs. One young man said that he'd heard a lot about camas, but had never had an opportunity to see it, let alone eat it. Another young woman expressed a desire to restore camas so that someday there would be enough for her people to harvest it again in the wild. I think that's a beautiful goal to bring back camas so there's enough for people and wildlife alike. Maybe we can grow together with that as a shared purpose. So with that in mind, I'd like to take a brief diversion to get better acquainted with camas a plant worthy of our admiration. Camas is in the asparagus family. Can you see the resemblance? The roots contain a complex sugar called inulin, which can be converted through long, slow cooking into fructose, which is very sweet. And I mean very long, slow cooking, 24 hours or more, I have heard, uh, unless you want a gluey mass, which is what I achieved with just three hours of cooking. Camas bulbs are good food for people. Camas also produces nectar and pollen, which are great food for a whole lot of insects. Camas blooms in April and May and the seed ripens in early summer. The seed falls to the ground or maybe it's planted by people or maybe by a tunneling vole. It won't germinate, however, until it passes through months of cold, wet weather. In fact, it can't germinate. It's that long period of cold and wet which primes the seed to germinate. So if you want to grow camas, sow it in the fall. When it comes up, it's this little tiny shoot in late winter or early spring. And the first year, that's all it does. It grows a couple of inches, then it withers to the ground at the first hint of summer weather. Above ground then, nothing's visible until the next February or March. When it comes up again, the second and third year, it looks about like this. 
The roots are still small, but they're getting bigger and going deeper. Until finally, year four, if you're lucky, or maybe later, the plant has developed a plump bulb and it's stored up enough energy finally to bloom. Then once the plants are established, the bulbs get larger, the plants get bigger, new plants begin to establish from seed that drops. So camas is very slow to grow from seed, but if we give it a good place and a bit of care, it will succeed. You just have to be patient. Camas is patient. Here's a photo from a house across the street from the land bank office in Friday Harbor. I've been walking past this rocky outcrop for 16 years and I never saw camas there before until this spring. That's because this year, the resident of the property cleared away the periwinkle vines that were covering the rocks. And it turns out there were camas bulbs there all this time, just waiting to be exposed to the light so they could bloom again. So although like salmon, camas is much reduced, it still hangs on here and there in the wild and even in downtown Friday Harbor. With that as our introduction to the plants, I'm going to move on and talk about a few of the other species we grow. Like camas, every plant has a story for us to discover. As the name suggests, death camas is quite toxic, including to people. Even its pollen and nectar are harmful to most insects. Here's satin flower, one of our very earliest wildflowers to bloom, sometimes as early as late January, more often February. This is one that we have to cage in order to get seeds uh, the deer love to eat the unripe seeds of satin flower. No wonder it's so rare in the wild if it can almost never make seed the source of new plants. This bed of fawn lily took, I think, five years from sowing the first seed to getting the first bloom. Very similar to camas in the way it grows. Another early bloomer is bicolored lupin, a little annual species, tiny, but thrives in dry, tough sites. Although the deer don't like bicolored lupin very much, we find it very hard to collect seed in the wild because the pods explode when the seed is ripe, sending it far and wide. Here's Western columbine, a favorite of hummingbirds and also bumblebees. The hummingbirds stick their bill up that long orange tube to get the flower's nectar, which is stored there in the bulb at the top, and they get covered with pollen in the process, spreading it from plant to plant. Some bumblebees, however, like the one shown here in the center of the photo, come in for a landing right on top there where the nectar is stored, they chew their way through. They steal their meal without doing any pollination at all. It's fun to watch. Sea blush, one of my favorites, a beautiful annual species that grows in very dry, tough sites like oak savanna or rocky shoreline. It also grows very happily in a pot in a sunny location. Sea blush is so easy to grow, so pretty and fragrant. I do encourage everyone to give it a try. Hanging up your laundry on a sunny day with the smell of sea blush and the sound of bumblebees, that's guaranteed to lift your spirits. Menzies larkspur has been an interesting one to grow. In the wild here in the islands, it's pretty uncommon and it only grows about six inches or so tall. But in the nursery, given space and deep soil and a little water, it easily reaches three feet in height. Farewell to spring comes into bloom, as the name suggests, just as summer's beginning. It's not common in the islands. Um, it's a highly variable species, 
shown here is some we grew from seed collected on Henry Island. And this one was grown from seed collected on Point Disney, Waldron Island, demonstrating the genetic variability that exists even between islands just a few miles apart. We grow two species of paintbrush, golden paintbrush and harsh paintbrush or orange paintbrush. These fascinating plants are both hemiparasites. They have specialized roots that attach to the roots of other species of plants that happen to be growing nearby. By doing this, they rob some of their host plants, water and nutrients. Early blue violet. This plant is the primary food for fritillary butterfly caterpillars. Without these violets, no fritillaries. Henderson's checker mallow, another interesting one to grow because in the wild, it's restricted to salt marsh habitats, but grown in cap uh, captivation, I guess you could say, in captivity, um, surprisingly easy to grow in any moist, deep soil, provided you protect it from deer. It would be interesting to know why in the wild, it only grows in salt marshes. Nodding onion, it's a wonderful garden plant, clump forming like chives, edible like chives, an excellent pollinator plant as well. Here's yampa, another Coast Salish food plant. It's in the carrot or parsley family and that little storage root you see there is, uh, has a, a very earthy carroty flavor you can eat it raw or cooked. Uh, and the seeds, sometimes called Indian caraway, are also fragrant and flavorful. Canada goldenrod. Here's another plant that's feasted upon by insects. In our region, 59 species of butterfly and moth caterpillars can eat this plant. The flowers are a favorite of late season bees and butterflies. The seeds feed songbirds in winter. It sometimes has a bad reputation for causing allergies, but this is in fact not true. Uh, it's plants with wind-borne pollen, wind-pollinated plants that cause allergies, like grasses, insect-pollinated plant, pollinated plants uh, don't do that. So you don't need to worry about allergies with Canada goldenrod. And that wraps up my gallery of plants and brings me near to the end of our talk. Just to show you a few places that these plants end up um, here uh, on the left, Katie Mountain Preserve. This is a patch grown from seed and plants at the Salish Seeds Project. On the right, volunteers planting uh, at a restoration site on Turtleback Mountain Preserve. Local restoration of golden paintbrush is happening with plants grown by the Salish Seeds Project. The San Juan Preservation Trust has been at the forefront of creating new habitat for island marble butterfly, using seeds and plants from the Salish Seeds Project to create safe places for this extremely rare creature to live. And we're doing more landscaping with Salish seeds plants at our preserved trailheads and structures, just to demonstrate that native plants can be used in all kinds of situations, and they actually look pretty good. Now I'd like to close with some ideas and I hope a little inspiration for the future. The work that the Preservation Trust does to conserve land is critical and the Salish Seeds Project is supporting the restoration of those lands. But all land has some value for plants and wildlife. And I like to think about how we might improve almost any place with these plants, not just the places we think of as nature reserves. How can we make camas so common that people can harvest it again? 
What if rooftops were alive with native flowers and insects? What if children grew, harvested, and ate camas in public school gardens? What if farms interplanted with native species to support biodiversity? What if seeds of local native species were swapped and shared in our community? What if everyone converted a bit of lawn to unmowed habitat? What if commercial building owners landscaped with a diversity of native species? And what if we all sowed native seeds at our doorsteps? These are not new ideas. People have been doing these sorts of things for years right here in the islands since well before the Salish Seeds Project existed. But I believe that by working together, we can make these what ifs become even more mainstream and ordinary. Let's make cameras truly common once again. Thank you for your attention. Looking at the time, I don't know if there are any questions. I'm happy to take a few minutes to answer if there are. Uh, and if not, or if we're out of time, I'm always happy to talk about plants. Feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you. Eliza, thanks so much for that fantastic talk. I've got a few questions that might be easily answered. Um, one is, how long can camas bulbs um, stay dormant like that, as, as you pointed out? Are we talking years? I don't know the answer. And I suspect that those bulbs were putting on a little growth. Uh, they were kind of smothered and they may also have been browsed by deer. So they may not have been totally without growth during those many years. Um, but I think there are probably people in this call who've had the experience of trimming back some shrubs and suddenly uh, camas or other plant is revealed to have been there waiting. So I wish I knew the answer, but I don't. That's great. Uh, if anybody else has any um, burning questions, you can feel free to put those in the Q&A. We've got about one or two more minutes. Um, another uh, question I received was, is it too late to plant sea blush seeds this year? I don't, <laughs> my questions are all, my answers are all, I don't know. It's best sown either in early fall, October is great, and it germinates and overwinters as a small plant, and then it's extra big and flowery in the spring, or I tend to sow it too in early March. For, however, if it's in a garden where it receives water, it might work just fine to sow it now. It seems like a very adaptable plant. So I don't know, but it's worth a try. They can report back. We stumped the scientists. My favorite is when scientists say, I don't know. It's it's just, it's the best answer. <laughs> I Let's see. With a banner flower year, is there any planting afloat to do a big harvest of native seeds with volunteers? That is a good question. Um, we do plan to do some seed collection in the wild. Um, I wasn't planning a big volunteer event, but uh, who knows what could what could come about. I, I, I actually do have an idea for Orcus, so check back with me on that. Great, and uh, final question here, where can we get sea blush seed? Um, you can get it from me, send me an email and I'll <laughs> tell you all about it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Eliza, is it best for folks to be able to contact you uh, for the Salish Seeds program by going to the either the SJPD website or the, the Land Bank website? Yes, I think either one would get you there. The Land Bank website has the most info, but I'm sure you can navigate to it through the Trust's Salish Seeds information as well. It's always great to see you. It's always great to see you out at Red Mill when I stop by. Eliza, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, this evening, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Keith. 
Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Eliza, for that inspiring presentation about your important work. And I want to thank you for all that you do for our community web of native plants and animals, to paraphrase Robinson Jeffers, not humans apart from that web. After the webinar ends, a reminder, you will have an opportunity to take a brief survey about the meeting. We would very much appreciate your comments and suggestions so that we can improve upon and continue to provide the most engaging experiences possible for our members. If you don't have time to take the survey immediately after the meeting, we'll be sending a follow-up email tomorrow that will have a link to the survey, as well as links to the recording of the webinar, to the videos you saw in the webinar, and to the Climate Scholarship and Salish Seeds Nursery fundraising opportunities mentioned during the meeting. Thank you all for joining us. Be safe, be healthy. The San Juan Preservation Trust 2022 annual meeting is now adjourned.